Hello, welcome to the channel and welcome to this review of Battle Tome Sylvaneth, the latest order battle tome for Warhammer Age of Sigmar from GW, who have very kindly sent this to me free of charge for your reviewing pleasure. Right, normal format, I'm going to open the book and have a look through it and ramble and talk about bits of it as I go through. If you want a, uh, a, a sort of tight, clipped, um, strategic review look elsewhere because this is not that okay oh as ever oh we have the front page bit which i really like the rustling of branches the crackle of the undergrowth whispers on the wind and a low haunting song of war that rises to a furious keening note such are the only warnings one receives before the sylvaneth strike these forest spirits are the guardians of nature, charged with the protection of the wild places, creatures of gnarled bark flesh and shimmering soul seed. They have dwelt amidst the woods and the sacred hearths, heaths since time immemorial, serving the will of their mother goddess and striking down any who threaten the realms. Though the Sylvaneth strive to preserve life, they are no strangers to taking it. Their talons and blades are wickedly sharp, and their command of natural magics is unrivalled. But with a melodious... <laughs> Lemmy's being very fussy this evening. But with a melodious incantation, their druidic leaders can call forth roots that burst from the ground to impale foes or whip up storms of flaying thorns. They are cunning and swift, masters of the ambush and the gorilla strike. To walk uninvited into the domain of the Sylvaneth is to dice with death, for they do not take kindly to intruders and make gruesome examples of any who approach without paying due respect. The march of history has not been kind to the Sylvaneth. They have been pushed to the edge of defeat, worn down through the centuries of atrocity until only the most warlike of their number remain. Yet, as spring follows winter, the children of the Ever Queen have written risen with renewed strength the song of rejuvenation once reduced to but a murmur now resounds the realm over in this new age the sylvaneth are in the ascendancy and fight with a fierce determination to spread the power of life to every corner of the cosmos woe betide any who would stand in their way for the forests are old and their memories are long and the protectors take any opportunity to meet out vengeance obviously the bit in the middle about the cat wasn't on the page so right the first diorama we've got is a really nice sort of um, oh it's against Beastmen and it's in a sort of overgrown almost dank wooden, woody sort of area not quite sort of like dank hold but bordering on it with a really nice orange glow very autumnal feel backlighting the ever queen very nice uh, as you'd expect we've got uh, some sections on the sylvaneth themselves the guardians of sanctity defenders of the wild places protectors of the circles and seasons the sylvaneth are a force unlike any other in the mortal realms these mysterious forest spirits fight to preserve their sacred lands. I always read it scarred lands for some reason. Battling the corrupt, the monstrous and the malign so that the realms might heal and thrive. Then we've got a diorama here from um, uh, Daron with the Lady of Vines fighting the maggot kin of Nurgle. The cycles persist, the seasons change. And yet our war, war to heal the realms is unending. The servants of foulness lurk in every nook and cranny. They pollute the earth with their presence. They take that which is pure. They stain it with their repulsive souls. Enough, I say. We will tolerate it no longer. We will hunt them down wherever they hide. Tear them out, root and stem. The Lady of Vines, of course, a very cool character from the Realm Gate Wars series of books. She's in about three of them, I think. Very cool character. Uh, <laughs> and 
and uh, I turn the page and it starts talking about the Realm Gate Wars. Um, so yeah, some blurb on the Realm Gate Wars, seed pods, uh, just basically a bit of background. The season of bloodshed uh, is the the ongoing wars across Gaithran, um, pushing back the uh, the forces of. Um, I assume. Where are we? The maggot kin. I can't see the word maggot kin anywhere. Oh, well, it, okay. So it's also there's a bit the bit here about the uh, the effect of the necroquake, which is good. The awakening of the realms, confronted by the ascendant power of death, the Sylvaneth could only rely on their cunning valour and tenacity to survive. Yet every night has a dawn, and Alariel had set plans in motion to bring about a grand reversal in fate, though the cost would be perhaps greater than any could have anticipated. The beast roars back. Then, uh... We're on a, a, a sort of more in-depth look at Gairan uh, and the nature of the Silvereth and Gairan and their connection together. Then, unsurprisingly, we have the um, the map of Gairan. Um, now, what do we have on here? Realm routes. They're interesting. Major realm routes. Because they're their... Um, Sort of passageway type things. That's how they get about. Uh, Fire Slayer Magma Holds. The Whirlways. Ah, yes, they're the. That's how uh, the Ivanath Deep can get around. Uh, Skaven Warren City. Natch. Resurgent places of power. I'm assuming they are. Uh, resurgent places of power. Let's have a look. doesn't seem to say oh, it absolutely confirms that you know the the um the touch of nurgle has uh gotten deep into garan and is not has, has not been eradicated by any stretch um then we've got the traditional Little vignettes in Age of Myth, Age of Chaos, Age of Sigma. The ordering of life. Though it may seem impenetrable and strange to the outsiders, Sylvanath society is in fact highly structured, with each forest spirit, excepting perhaps the spiteful and twisted outcasts, instinctively knowing their place in the natural order. At the apex of the hierarchy stands the mother goddess, Al Alariel. Not Aladriel, Alariel, to whom every Sylvaneth owes the utmost fealty. So, then you've got different. Ah, these are the different glades. Uh, how do they relate? Are they the hosts? Okay, so, you've got. The Royal Moot, wherein the High King of Oakenbrow. Yeah, this is this is the Oakenbrow. Um, so Oakenbrow is one of the sub factions. Um, Oakenbrow, the first amongst equals, the largest of all glades, with hundreds of clans spread across the realms. Their wisdom, nobility, and loyalty to the Ever Queen is beyond reproach. Though the pride of these old growths, some growths, sometimes sees them earn. The enmity of the forest spirit kin. Um, the royal moot. Wherein the high king of Oakenbrow, the old king of Nalroot, the willow queen of Harvestborn, the old king of Winterleaf. So these are sort of characters, I assume. Um, the free spirits, grown from the seeds of war and planted in the blood scap of the courageous. 
these independent and martially minded forest spirits stand ready to do the bidding of their beloved queen and make her will manifest across the mortal realms. The Heartwood Glaive. None braver are there and none more are true. So, hang on. Open brow. No. Root. Heart. Ah, uh, okay. So these are the, they're the different, uh, um, sub factions. That's why they're not. It's an interesting page. This it's got a sort of weird sort of tree of life type diagram, and it's not particularly instinctual, instinctive to read. But on off the back of it, we have uh, a page for Oakenbrow. They're the ones I just read out. A page for Nalroot. The rulers of Nalrut Glade are life mages of profound skill, able to bind the energies of the natural world in astounding displays of sparcraft. They are regarded as grim, taciturn, 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 and secretive by their fellows. They serve a key purpose in Alariel's designs as keepers of arcane treasures and masters of eldritch secrets. Then we've got Harvest Moon. Surging forward like a spring gale, the harvest moon embody all the vitality of life. Youthful and vibrant by the standards of the great glades, they have swiftly established a reputation as ardent crusaders, crusaders against chaos. Yet their relative naivety may well have its consequences, given time. Ironbark. There's no little thing for these. There's only the whole paragraph. I'm not going to read it all. So you've got Ironbark, Winterleaf, Heartwood, Dreadwood... Dreadwood? That's interesting. There's always been something amiss with the Dreadwood Glaive. The soul pods were not planted in sun-dappled groves, but in the recesses of the deepest forests, often those of Shaish and Ulglu. Ulg? Ulg. Where shadows grew thick. Interesting. Then we've got a page on Laria the Everqueen. And then the named characters, Lady of Vines and Dracha Hammerdreth. A bit about outcasts. Some say they were once sprites who made grim bargains in an effort to become true Sylvaneth. Or else that they are the product of a ritual of Alarios that went hideously array, awry. They are shunned by most forest spirits. And there is an unspoken fear that the outcasts represent some spiritual malaise that could affect, afflict any Sylvaneth. So they're kind of like flayed ones, Necron flayed ones, the equivalent. Uh, there's something not right about them, and uh, they get shunned. So free spirits, so what are these? Whilst most Sylvaneth belong to a specific glade or clan, there are those who serve at the direct behest of the Everqueen herself. These free spirits are her greatest champions and generals to ensure that the goddess's will is carried out no matter where the forest spirits take root. So, the spirits of Durthu. I did think for a while this was a character, but it's not. It's it's a... It's a... It's a spirit of Durthu. Durthu. The Kurnoth hunters are not from particular glades. They are free spirits. As are the Sprite Rider Lancers, the Gossamid Archers, and the Arch Revenants. There's info on all of those here. I wonder how that translates to their keywords. I've just realised why it's dark in here. I don't have the light on. Yay! It's light! Um, right, the War Host of the Wildwoods. Noble spirits are the rulers and standing armies of the clans. Courageous tree folk invested with precious lamentiri. Invested with precious lamentiri. When war beckons, they provide the core of a war grove strength, wielding their strange powers to achieve victory in Alariel's name. So here you've got the branch witches, the revenant seekers, and the tree lords. I think revenant seekers are the uh, revenants that are flying on the um, big massive insects. Oh, there's more. There's more. Tree lord ancients. Warsong Revenants, Tree Revenants. 
Then Dryads, we can watch these separately. Though the Dryads were once peaceful and kindly, years of strife have allowed bitterness to take root in their souls. When the war groves march, it is these forest folk who provide the greatest numbers, and they take any opportunity to visit a painful end upon those who would defile their sacred domains. <laughs> Have some of that. Then we're into dioramas again. There's another sort of backlit autumnal one. This time it's um, um, Ogre Moor Tribes. Uh, picture of Alariel on her massive beetle. Gossamid archers with their flying symbiotes grabbing on, holding on for dear life. Uh, uh, Revenant Seekers, yes, they are the insect flying ones against some uh, night haunts with a nice load of uh, mist. And it looks like a long exposure on the camera to make them wish mist go all swirly, which is cool. Uh, some other. It's got a sort of purpley, bluey background, as has this other picture here. A bit of a purple background. It's obviously Shaishan, because it's, uh, it's Osiok Bone Reapers with a purple hue. Oh, and then we have uh, Oryx, uh, specifically Cruel Boys, in the swamp. And the, the named characters, Dracha and the Lady of Vines. Spirits of Durthu. I think the Spirits of Durthu are really cool. They've got that sort of great autumnal glow. They look like they've got fire coming from inside their heads and just sort of amber from inside their swords. I think they're lovely in um, in Gur or anywhere, to be quite honest. I think they look lovely and autumnal, which is great. Oh, this next one. These are Head Knights of Slanesh. These lot are facing off against lots of uh, Kernuth warriors and... Um, and tree lords, and uh, what can only be described as an omnom tree, uh, and some dryads. Very nice. Oh, then we've got a few. What have we got here? We've got uh, uh, what's it called? It's like a myrmidon ogre. I can't remember. It's sort of like an ogre. Um, yeah, it's slave to darkness. Anyway. Then um, Gloom Spite, Maggotkin, Beastman, more Gloom Spite, a lot of squigs, and very, very much underground. Yes. Then we have the painting section. I always like the painting section, I think it's so cool. Uh, then we've so first one is oaken brow bark so a scheme to do the bark from an open oaken brow glade uh, yep it's a gray seer undercoat with militarum green and then all sorts of flashy highlights but basically it looks like you can just spray it with gray seer and paint it with militarum green sold uh, foliage and light bark, so leaves and stuff. Gnarl root bark, being a different kind of bark. Uh, the bitter grub carapace, so you got lots of those little gnarly, creepy crawlies. Uh, different ways of painting the foliage, different shades of bark. Um, heartwood bark. These have white leaves. They're very cool. A lamentary. What's Lamentary? It looks like it's some kind of inner energy root. It's like a blue root inside of the guy's ribcage. Green bark and weapons. The, uh, they're very nice, really pale green weapons. They look very cool. Base coat with Celestra Grey and use thin down warp lightning to achieve a deep green before highlighting with pallid witch flesh. Super. Oh, God, there's more. It keeps going. It keeps going! Iron bark bark, iron bark bark, grey bark, more foliage, purple weapons, winter leaf dark bark, that's easy for you to say, dark bark, uh, that looks like a, it looks very effective, it looks like a royal pain, it's um, highlight with dark reaper, highlight with thunderhawk, fine highlight of feminism grey, or in other words, uh, 
a big splodge on the first one and then a light dry brush of one of them after I give up on the highlighting because I'm no good at highlighting. Winter weaponry, dreadwood bark, light bark, foliage, harvest moon bark. They have got all of the schemes. I think it's all the schemes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, all the sub factions they've got the paint scheme for, which I quite like. Different flesh variants for the uh, outcasts. There's a sort of blue glowy one. There's a dark blue, really evil, malign type one. Um, then some details on how they painted Alario the Everqueen and the hives on Dracha. The wings. Yeah, really good. I really like that, that level of detail in the books. It's just... I don't know why they don't do that in 40k books. I really don't. Love that in the battle terms. Right, now we're on to the rules. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, so first off. Glades. You can pick one of the following sub-factions. And they are the ones that we discussed. Oakenbrow, Gnarl Root, Heartwood, Ironbark, Winterleaf, Dreadwood, Harvest Boon. Places of power. So this is an interesting one. In the previous book, my understanding was you got to set up one Awakened Wildwood uh, as your terrain piece. And then loads of your spellcasters got access to creating more Awakened Wildwoods. But the problem was, was that if you'd made yourself a nice board, there wasn't really anywhere to put them. So what we did in some of our games was say, all right, this terrain piece that's all woody you can turn it into an Awakened Wildwood by doing the spell. I don't want to sound smug, but... Uh, no, well, they're not actually doing that. However, what they have done is they've said, when you've determined your territories, before you set up your terrain features, you can, the Sylvaneth player can pick three terrain features that are wholly outside of their opponent's territory. And those terrain features are considered by you to be overgrown terrain features and to all intents and purposes i mean there might be a couple of subtle exceptions but from what i've read they are basically awakened wildwoods so you basically set up your nice woodland board and go yeah i'll have that that and that they're all overgrown they're awake they, they've woken up and then you put your awakened wildwood down so you got your four um Apologies. Um, at the start of your hero phase, you can heal a wound allocated to each Sylvaneth unit wholly within nine inches of an overgrown terrain feature or a friendly awakened wildwood. Of course, it doesn't have the proviso that if you've got a dead one, it brings them back to life. That's still in the domain of the death of death. But so it only really benefits your multi-wound models. But with your tree lords and your kernoths, uh, yeah, that's cool. From the woodland depths, right? We're gonna have two rules here. So previously, you used to be able to, do, and I can't remember the specifics. Um, in my games with Moog, I remember us working out at the time, but I, I, I can't remember what they were. But basically, you could go into Awakened Wildwoods and come out of other ones. They've tweaked that, the way that works. So once a turn, at the end of your movement phase, you can pick a friendly Sylvaneth unit that's within 9 inches of an Awakened Wildwood or an Overgrown Terrain feature. You remove it from the battlefield and bring it back on within 9 inches of either a different Overgrown Terrain feature uh, or Awakened Wildwood uh, that is more than 3 inches from enemy units. So most of the redeployment mechanics in the game, you have to stay nine inches away from the enemy. No, not with these. If your enemy are... You need to come out within nine inches of an, of a, an Awakened Wildwood or an Overgrown Terrain feature, but you can be practically right next to them, uh, which makes them really interesting for battlefield control, I think. So that's walk the hidden paths. 
and it's once per turn. I think I remember reading things that let you do that again. Um, then you have Strike and Fade, which is also interesting. Again, once per turn, but in the combat phase, immediately after a friendly Silver Knife unit that is within nine, wholly within nine inches of an Overwatch or Infantry or Awakened Wildwood, you can remove it from the battlefield and set it up again. More than nine inches away from all enemy units, wholly within nine inches of a different overgrown terrain. I'm confused now. Let me read that again. After the unit has fought, you can remove that unit from the battlefield and set it up again. More than nine inches from all enemy units and wholly within nine inches of either a different overgrown terrain. That is more than th this. Okay. That's more than three inches from enemy units or a different friendly awakened wildwood that's more than three inches away from enemy units. So you can't. Basically, you can fight and you can leg it. Uh, so, if you make a charge, fight, then run away. They don't get to strike you back. Obviously, the uh, hitty sequence is a thing, but in theory, run in, hit them, run away. Uh, there's a bit more constraint about where you can run to, because the entire terrain feature or wildwood cannot be within three inches of the enemy. So, it's almost in their interests to stay that close to stop you running away to those um what to those woods but conversely you can walk the hidden paths to get to them to beat them up in the first place so you could quite conceivably if they're by one wood you could go from halfway across the board pop out using walk the hidden paths in the movement phase then you could charge them beat them up then jump back in at the in the combat phase using strike and fade and go back out to where you came from. Interesting. And also, ouch! Verdant Blessing. Ah, Verdant Blessing is a spell. It has a casting value of 6 and a range of 18. If successfully cast, it's one awakened wildwood terrain feature. Wholly within range, invisible to the caster. More than three inches from all other models, endless spells, invocations, terrain features, and objectives. And add it to your army. So there's got to be space for you to put it down. But if there isn't space for you to put it down, it's not a big game changer because um, you've already got three, three, what, three uh, terrain pieces have overgrown. And this just gives you some versatility to potentially be um, yeah, so the Sylvanoth Wizards all know the Verdant Blessing spell in addition to any other spells they know. So they're going to have the spell on their, their War Scroll, the two basic spells from the rule book, so Arcane Bolt and Mystic Shield. They'll know Verdant Blessing and one from the lore. Now this is quite nice. This is a, 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 little, a little extra thing. Uh, it still comes under the back of the phrase. Seasons of War. Basically, you're either in summer, spring, winter, or autumn. I mean, they're called the burgeoning, the reaping, the dwindling, and the ever dusk, but spring, summer, autumn, winter. Oh, excuse me, my back is really hurting now. It's been a long day sat in this chair. It's like nine o'clock in the evening, and I'm desperately trying to get this done. Oh, I think desperately. You go, come on, come on, come on, read, read, read. Um, so you pick one of these to be the season that your army is fighting in. You, it says, it's one of these things, it says you must record it on your army roster. So I guess it makes a difference if you're going to events and things. But I think in reality, most players will just pick the one they want at the start of the game. Um, but the burgeoning. Friendly Sylvanath units that did not charge in the same turn and are wholly within nine inches of overgrown terrain feature or friendly awakened wildwood have a ward of six plus. So don't charge, stay close, get a ward save. The reaping are three inches to the range which you can pick friendly Sylvanath units with the places of power and the from the woodland depths. 
battle traits. What? Oh, right, okay. So the places of power is the um, getting healed f from nearby woods. So that would go from 9 to 12 inches if you're in the reaping. And the from the woodland depths is the overarching title of the two abilities, walk the hidden paths and strike and fade. So they would become 12 inch range rather than 9 inch range if you are in the reaping. Because the coming of Midsummer sees the power of Sylvaneth in full bloom, the influence of Spirit Song and Garan's natural energies at their peak. The dwindling. As light grows shorter, the Sylvaneth draw deeply upon their potent life magics, preparing to endure the harsh months of Everdusk. In the hero phase, you can reroll one casting roll, one unbinding roll, and one dispel roll. So long as the friendly wizard you pick is a Sylvaneth wizard and wholly within nine inches of an overgrown terrain feature or awakened wildwood. Stay close, do better magic. And then the Everdusk. As much as Gyron's power wanes, the dearth of vital energies imbues many Sylvaneth with a cold and bitter fury. Subtract three from the range within which you can place friendly Sylvaneth units um within the places of power from the woodland depth battle traits um so it's, it goes from nine down to six uh however if your modified hit roll for an attack made with a melee weapon by a friendly silver unit is wholly within six inches of an overgrown terrain feature friendly wildwood is a six the attack scores two hits instead of one so the less you've got, the more you fight for it. And your sixes explode. Punchy, punchy. They're very cool. They they are flavoursome. And it's a tasty flavour too. Sort of like cheese and onion crisps. Very tasty. But they're potatoes, so we don't say that too loud near the tree folk. Uh, oh. Oh, the pollen has been horrendous today. It really has. Right. Okay, so we're not, now we're on to enhancements. Command traits. Uh, aspects of war are for Sylvaneth heroes only. Gnarled warrior. Ignore modifiers, both positive and negative, to save rolls. Lord of Spites. Ah. Shouldn't it be sprites? Impish forest spirits aid this general with an array of venoms and snares. Spiteful sprites, maybe? I don't know. In the combat phase, subtract one from the attack characteristic of melee weapons used by enemy units to a minimum of one that finish a piling move within... Within three inches of this jet Minus one to attack characteristics if you're within three inches of general, basically. Uh... And then we have War Singer. Generals in the battlefield to start the movement phase. Add three to the movement characteristic of friendly Sylvaneth units that start the move wholly within 12 inches of this general until the end of the phase. So you've got to measure it out. Oh no, to start them. Oh, so you don't. Presumably, someone has said if you move out of the range of a general, you lose the three inches. <laughs> Three inches to move if you're within 12 inches of your general. Then we have Aspect of Renewal, which are for wizards only. Nurtured by magic, once per turn, if you cast a spell that's not unbound, you can pick a friendly Sylvaneth unit within 18 inches and heal d3 wounds. That's the, so that isn't an extra spell, that's, um, that's your command trait. Spell Singer. When the general attempts to cast a spell, before making the casting roll, you can pick a friendly awakened wildwood on the battlefield. It doesn't say or overgrown wood. Um, maybe that's an error, I don't know. So this is potentially an instance of them differentiating. Uh, if you do so and the spell is successfully cast and not unbound, you must measure the range of visibility for that spell from that awakened wildwood. 
Okay, so any spell you attempt to cast, you can basically throw it out from any Awakened Wilder on the battlefield. It's like, okay, I really want to put Mystic Shield on those guys over there. Dink. Right, now we're into Artifacts of Power. So, Boons of the Ever Queen. So these are for heroes, and then Relics of Nature for wizards. Uh, the Greenwood Gladius. Pick one of the bearer's weapons... At the start of the combat phase, roll a d3. Add the res plus d3 attacks, basically. Crown of Fell Bowers. At the start of the combat phase, pick an enemy unit within 6 inches. Add 1 to wound rolls for attacks made by friendly Sylvaneth that target that unit. Okay, so you pick a unit and you uh, and then everyone gets to you know fawn it and give it a good kick in. Seed of Rebirth. The first time the bearer is slain, uh, they get back up on a 2 plus on D3 wounds. Then the Relics of Nature. Oops. Um, Acorn of. So these are the wizard, wizard ones. Wizard. Acorn of the Ages. Once per battle, at the start of the hero phase. You can set up one Awakened Wildwood feature with Holy Within 12 Inches of the Bearer. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, okay. So you can just free Awakened Wildwood in your hero phase. The Acorn of Ages. This unassuming acorn is verdant life given form. You just throw it down and a Wildwood appears. That's cool. Lunette's Lamp. The bearer can attempt to banish an invocation in the hero phase, even if they are not a priest. In addition, add two to the spelling rolls and banishment rolls for the bearer. I really must read about priests and invocations. They haven't come up in any of my games as of yet. But I don't know how they work. So this doesn't make as much sense. The Vesperal Gem. Once per turn, when you attempt to cast a spell from the Lore of Deep Wood, instead of making a casting roll, you can say you'll use the gem. If you do, it's automatically pass, cast. Do not make the roll. Cannot be unbound. After the effect of the spell has been resolved, roll the dice on a 1. The bearer suffers D3 mortal wounds. Malice and mercy dwell in this gemstone in equal measure, visible as fey lights swirling at its core. In a, I used to play in a, a, a live roleplay club and one of the uh, monsters, one of the rare monsters, if you cut off its horns and turn them into, a, into potions, one potion was instant death, the other was um, equivalent of a resurrection, but they were undivinable, you couldn't work out. The only way to know which one it was was by drinking it. Kind of feels like that. It's like, yep, yeah, you spell, it happened, you can't unbind it, or no, I'm feeling angry, die. Cool. Okay, Law of the Deep Wood. So here are the spell laws. Uh, Throne of Vines. Oh right! I'm just spotted that. I, sorry, I just read it and I thought that doesn't sound. That's that's rubbish. But I found the key word. Throne of Vines' spell has a casting value of nine. It's like how could this be nine? If successfully cast at the end of each phase, phase until the start of your next hero phase, you can heal one wound allocated to the caster. So you cast in the hero phase, then you'll get one back in the shooting phase, in the charge phase, in the combat phase, in the battle shock phase. And then right the way through your opponent's five phases. So that's potentially nine wounds you'll regain. And if you can get somewhere where they're not going to kill you. Yeah, that's cool. I like that. Situational, but cool. Regrowth. Cast a value of five, range of 18. Pick a friendly silver enough unit. Heal up to D3 wounds allocated to the unit. The dwellers below. Seven, range 12. 
Pick an enemy unit, roll a number of dice equal to the models in that unit for each five suffers a mortal wound. Drawing upon the darkest and most spiteful aspects of nature's power, the caster summons a seething swarm of tendrils from beneath the ground. Oh yes, I can see the vines writhing up and the thorns digging in and pulling down. Very cool. Deadly Harvest. Value of six, range of three inches. Cast on an enemy unit within range. Each enemy unit within range of the caster suffers D3 mortal wounds. Ah! Oh! Just as the Sylvaneth can instinctively channel the flowing energies of life magic to nurture and heal, those of a darker bent can also stem the flood or leach it away altogether. Are there any... Well, obviously, uh, Alara... Sorry, I think I leant on the keyboard there. I don't know how long for. Uh, and the cursor was over the pause button. Oops. Because the, the laptop's like here and it's on an angle, you see, and the trackpad's right here. Uh, mm. I'll move a bit so that doesn't happen again. Um, I was going to say, yeah, Alario can obviously do super magic, but is there... Are there any other of the big trees who are wizards? Yes, the Tree Lord Ancient is a wizard. Okay, so we'll come to... I don't know if he always used to be, but we'll come to that. So... The Tree Lord Ancient can use Throne of Vines. To, he's only on like two wounds left. But that's alright. I'll cast Throne of Vines and I'll be fine in a turn as long as they don't hit me. Or Deadly Harvest. You run him in and there's three or four enemy units piled around him. And you just go, everyone out D3 mortal wounds. And then in the mm -hmm. combat phase, just stand on them. Uh, no, no, the charge phase, stand on them. In the combat phase, punch them. Ooh. Virtuous Harmony. Seven, range of 18. Pick a friendly Sylvaneth unit, wholly within range of visible. Return one slain model to the unit. If you pick Dryad's Tree Revenants or Spite Revenants, you can heal D3. That's cool. The wizard plucks the youngest sprouts of magic and uses them to renew the broken forms of fallen warriors. Just sort of grabbing their spite spirit from the air and just putting them into a, into a seed and making it grow like that and last but not least well, I imagine not least tree song value of 7 range of 16 odd range if successfully cast pick one friendly awakened wildwood within range until the start of your next hero phase improve the rend characteristic of melee weapons by friendly silverneth by one, whilst they're wholly within nine inches of an awakened wildwood. The caster implores the simple spirits of the wildwoods to guide the blades of their allies and expose the weakness of the foes. I know one of the complaints that some people have had about this book is the lack of rend. Not this book, this army. In the, in the last book was the lack of rend. There you go, that's a way of guessing it. It all... Now that specifically says Awakened Wildwood, not Awakened Wildwood slash Overgrown uh, Terrain feature. So that's another potential difference. You need the actual Wildwood to get that. Okay, then you've got the Seven Glades. So, Oakenbrow. Our roots run deep. Uh, when determining which row to use on the damage table... It's treated as having suffered half the number of wounds that are actually allocated to it. Null root. Keepers of the arcane. No, probably not. Um, when you cast a spell within nine inches of an overgrown terrain or awakened wildwood, use 3d6 instead of 2. Remove one dice of your choice from the roll. Cool. Wizardtastic. Heartwood. Masters of the hunt. After deployment but first, before the first battle round begins, pick up to three different units to be the quarry. Three different enemy units. Sorry, I, th I just assumed that was going to say you get a free move because that's what these things normally do say. Pick three enemy units to be the quarry of the hunt. Add one to hit rolls made by friendly heartwood units to target those units. Interesting. I like that. Stand firm. 
the command ability at the start of the enemy combat phase. Within three inches of an enemy unit that charged you. On a two plus, they suffer D3 mortal wounds. You can use this command ability more than once in the same phase, but if you do so, you cannot pick the same enemy unit more than once in the same phase. Winterleaf, Winter's Bite. Enemy units with three inches of Winterleaf units cannot retreat. If you pick Everdusk for the Season of War battle trait for a Winterleaf army, enemy units within three inches of a friendly Winterleaf unit cannot be removed from the battlefield through an effect that would allow them to be set up again later in the battle. So if you're fighting, I don't know, I don't know why you would be fighting Astral Templars, so fighting Stormcast Eternals, not just because I, I know that um, um, I say no, I can't remember what the Lumin unit's called now. Um, Vanguard. No, no, okay. So examples, forget examples, but you can't retreat, and if you've chosen ever winter, then you cannot be. You cannot use an ability that lets you disengage, disappear, and be reset up back on the battlefield if you're within three inches of a Winterleaf unit. Dreadwood, Malicious Tormentors. Once per battle, you can use Walk Through the Hidden Paths twice in the same turn. But at least one of the units you pick must be Dreadwood Spite Revenants. In addition, once per battle, you can use Strike and Fade uh twice but one of them must be spite revenants then harvest boon virulent surge after deployment before the first battle round begins you can move each harvest moon sprite rider lancers and revenant seekers up to 12 inches so you get a, the flying ones can fly ahead right skipping through the majority of the path to glory um We've got a funky looking um, battle plan. Awaken the Groves. A valley once rich with sacred life has finally shared a centuries long curse concealing its whereabouts. But the soul pod groves that once blossomed there now lie dormant and defenceless. Hostile forces have now descended upon the site, intent on final destruction of the groves, heeding the distant spirit song of the imperiled woodland. The Sylvaneth gather to purge the valley of its spoilers and restore the soul pod groves to their rightful splendour. So this is three objectives that are soul pod groves. Um, special command ability for the guardians. Um, returning slain models to the unit. Special command ability for the trespassers. I'd want to wound rolls whilst within 12 inches of a friendly hero. Follow my lead. Undaunted by the fervent resolve of the Sylvanath, the champion amongst the trespassers joins the fray with such wrath that all rise to their example. Glorious victory. If all units in the Guardian's army are destroyed, the trespasser wins a major victory. If fewer than two soul pod groves are awakened when the battle ends, the trespasser wins a minor victory. How do they awake? Waking the groves. Starts from the second battle round. Roll the dice at the start of the Guardian's hero phase will reach soul pod grove that is more than six inches from all enemy units. So these are your three objectives. Add two to the result for each unit from the Guardian's army that's wholly within six inches of a soul pod grove. On a seven plus, the soul pod grove has been awakened. The Awakened Soul Pod Grove is treated as an Awakened Wildwood Faction Terrain feature in the Guardian's Army for the rest of the battle. So it's a combination of how much the Trespasser kills and how many Groves get awakened as to who wins. Excellent! That looks like fun. I might have a go at that. Then we've got uh, War Scroll Battalions. We've got the War Groves. 
So we've got five different ones. They all have the same command ability. When you pick your army, you get a second free Awakened Wildwood. So you've got three spirits, uh, which is a spirit of Durthu, an Arch Revenant, three Kurath Hunter units, a Gossamid Archer unit, and one Dragon, Lan Dragon Spike Lancers. Lords of the Clan, a boatload of tree lords. Household, one tree lord, one branch witch, one tree revenants, and one revenant seekers. Forest folk, three dryads. Outcasts, three spite revenant units. Then there's a bunch of match play stuff. Uh, Alariel the Ever Queen. So, I won't go through all the stuff. But um, 16 wounds, 3 plus save. Move starts at 16 and degrades to 13. Spear of Kurnoth, 1 attack, 2 plus 2 plus minus 2. Then a degrading damage that starts at 6 and goes down to 3. Melee weapons, Talon of the Dwindling. It's not very much. The Great Antlers of the, uh, the Beastie. 4 attacks, 3 plus 2 plus minus 2. Damage starts at five, goes down to two. She's a wizard who knows three spells and can cast three spells. OMG. This unit can fly. Life Bloom. In your hero phase, you can heal up to 2d6 wounds allocated to this unit. you got to kill her. Once per battle, the end of your hero phase, if the unit's been destroyed... On a 6 plus, you can set it up again on the battlefield with 8 wounds remaining. Living Battering Ram does mortal wounds on uh, a stomp, a better stomp rampage. Soul Poor, Soul of Fourier. Soul of Fourier? Once per battle, the end of the movement phase, you can summon one of the following units 20 Dryads, 10 Tree Revenants, 10 Spike Revenants. Three Kernel Hunters, one Branch Witch, or one Tree Lord. Swirling Glow Spites. Glow Spites. Unit can retreat and still shoot and, shoot and charge. Um, Talent of the Dwindling. Okay, I did think that was a touch lackluster. Um, If you wound a model with the Town of the Dwindling, roll a dice on a six, it just dies. Metamorphosis spell. Uh, roll a number of dice equal to 60 in its range. Roll a number of dice equal to the casting roll. For each three plus units of a mortal wound. If a unit is destroyed, set up an awakened wildwood from near them. You turn them into trees. Right of life. Once per battle, start your hero phase. You can say, Ilariel will voice the verse of the right of life. <laughs> Until the end of the turn, all terrain features on the battlefield that are not already considered to be overgrown terrain features are considered to be overgrown terrain features. <laughs> Everyone, wake up quick. Okay, Lady of Vines I won't go through because I've gone through her in the um, in the box review a little while ago. Dracha um, hasn't fundamentally changed any from what I can see, except I believe she belonged to a particular grove last time. She doesn't now. She's just a freely independent character, as is the Lady of Vines. It's not tied to a particular grove. Um, Dracha is a wizard. Was she a wizard before? Well, she's a wizard now. Um, she still has the mercurial aspect. She's a, excuse me, she's either enraged or embittered. Um, so the colony of flutterflies normally has an attack characteristic of 10. Um, if she's enraged, it goes up to 20 attacks with a 12 inch range. 3 plus 3 plus minus 1, 1. One of her melee weapons is Swarm of Squirmlings. 10 attacks, 3 plus 3 plus minus 1, 1. If she is embittered, the Squirmlings go to 20 attacks. 
Song of Spite. I'd want to wound rolls for friendly spite revenants within 18 inches. Primal Terror is her spell. 12 inch rage. Cast an enemy. Roll 2d6. Uh, if you beat the target's bravery, it suffers d3 mortal wounds. Oh, each unit within 12 inches. Okay. Yeah, I mean, she is a scary dude. Yes, she is. Uh, Warsong Revenant. Um, add buffs bravery of nearby units and debuffs enemy bravery. Wizard, two spells. Ward Saber 4 plus. Wildwood Revenants. Add one to casting rolls whilst within nine inches of Awakened Wildwoods or overgrown terrain features. Unleash the Swarm of Spites. Cast a value of 7, range of 9. Number of dice equal to the casting roll for each 5 plus the unit suffers a mortal wound. The Arch Revenant is a flyy, punchy uh, person. He can either adopt a defensive stance or an aggressive stance. Um... He'll either get a 4 plus ward save for being a gr uh, defensive or an extra attack for being aggressive, taking his attacks from 4 to 5. That doesn't seem like a good trade, to be honest. A ward of 4 plus, exchanging it for one attack that's one damage. Uh, add one to wound rolls for friendly Colonel Thunders within 12 inches. Command ability. Uh, play it on a friendly Silver Death unit. They add one to their attack characteristic. That's nice. They have a big unit of Dryads. They'll get an extra attack each. Spirit of Durthu. Uh, it's worth mentioning. So these are two different types of tree men, obviously. Uh, they're 14 wounds, 3 plus. So Spirit of Dirthu and Tree Lord Ancient. And the Tree Lord. They all have Ground Shaker and Spirit Paths in common. Um, which are... It's a monstrous rampage. So basically before it happened, before monstrous rampages. But obviously that was probably before they were a thing. Uh, they've now harmonised it. It is a monstrous rampage you can do. Uh, you pick an enemy unit within three inches. On a three plus, uh, they gain the strike last effect, which is, can be pretty handy, but it's only on a three plus. Spirit paths. Start your movement phase. If it's wholly within six inches of an overgrown terrain for which you're awakened wildwood, it can walk the spirit paths instead of making a move. Take off the battlefield, put it within six inches of another uh, Awakened Wildwater Red Red Terrain feature, but more than nine inches from enemy units. So those are common to all three of the tree lords. The Spirit of Durthu also gets Wrathful Guardian. Add one to attack characteristics of the Guardian Sword whilst within nine inches of friendly woody things. Uh, he has six attacks with his Guardian Sword. Which are, is a two, a two damage weapon when he's on full strength. His Verdant Blast is a 15 inch range attack. Six attacks on full profile. Four plus three plus minus one damage two. That's nice. Um, the Tree Lord is a wizard. Spirit Durthu, not a wizard. Tree Lord, ancient, sorry, is a wizard. Awaken the wild, awaken the wood. Uh, pick a friendly wild wood somewhere on the battlefield. If an enemy unit is within three inches of it, it takes D three mortal wounds. Each enemy unit within three inches of that wild wood takes D three mortal wounds. Whew. Like a scene out of Lord of the Rings. It can also has an ability that lets it set up awakened wild woods. Your general tree lord. 
a general. So the spirit of Dirth and the Tree Lord are both heroes. The Tree Lord is simply a monster. Has Grand Shaker and Spirit Paths. Uh, Lash and Tangle is its other ability. Um, if an attack made with a melee weapon by this unit scores a hit, models in the target unit cannot make piling moves until the end of that turn. So it stops you gain it stops you ganging up on the tree lord. Getting all your extra models in. That'd be very good against the Skaven who now have an obscene amount of attacks if they all get to pile in. That's good. It's got a ranged weapon, strangle roots, three attacks, two damage. Yeah, cool. Uh, Branch Witch still a wizard. <laughs> Gossamid archers were in the other box, so we'll look at those. Uh, Spite Rider Lancers, five wounds, 14 inch move, four plus save. So are the Revenant Seekers, they both have that profile. Uh, Spite Rider Lancers, four attacks. 3 plus 3 plus minus 2, 1. Sharp Mandibles. 3 attacks. 4 plus 3 plus minus 1, 1. They're quite punchy. Obviously they can fly. The strike first effect. They get to strike first if they're charged. 'ming with life at the end of each phase if an enemy model was slain by an attack made by this unit you can heal all wounds allocated to this unit so you've got to kill models wholly otherwise they will get better thrumming with life I like that you sort of feel the verdant green energy just materializing in their wounds and solidifying with a sort of faint warm green glow the reverend seekers not quite as we'll say not as punchy fewer attacks but they got more damage harvesters of the lamentary once per turn pick a friendly silver unit with a wound characteristic of five or less on a two plus you can return one model to that unit also thrumming with life okay so these are two very similar units they're a little bit different aesthetically very different narratively. Yeah, I mean, these bite light rider lancers are uh, allowed as elite cavalry. The revenant seekers, it's their duty to harvest the lamentary of the silver who fall in battle. So they're sort of. Um, I was going to say ripper swarms. They're uh, cleany uppy peoples. Kurnoff Hunters don't appear to have changed very much. I think the save has gone up. I don't think they were 3 plus before. I think they're 3 plus now. Um, what has changed, is, and I don't know if you could do this before, um, but the, there's one entry for Hunters with Bows, one entry for Hunters with Greatswords, and one entry for Hunters with Scythes. I don't know if you could mix and match them before. Something's telling me you could, but now they're, they're mono units. Dryads, um, two inch range for their racking talons, which is good because when you've got a load of them, you can get more attacks in. Two attacks each, four plus four plus no rend one. Um, minus one from hit and wound rolls that attack them if they're within nine inches of friendly shrubberies. They are, they haven't changed them a lot. And they haven't changed conceptually, but they're getting more attacks and they're harder to kill. Um, the fact that these are numerous and bitter and will just crawl all over you and try and pull you to pieces. Kind of like the zombies of the forest. Uh, yeah, that'll do the job. Um... Tree Revenants. So, Tree Revenants and Spite Reven Revenants. One big change is these now have two wounds. 
So they used to fold like an origami swan previously, uh, but they've got two winners each now. Other than that, they don't look like they've changed very much. The Tree Reverence Musician still lets you walk through the paths um, and take it up uh, and redeploy your unit. Um, once per round, they get to either all out attack or all out defense without the command being issued or a point being spent, which is nice. Um, Sprite Revenants, Spite Revenants um, do the sixes to hit, do mortal wounds thing. Uh, they have three attacks each, so a big bunch of those does a lot of damage. Protective does a lot of damage. Three plus to hit, three plus to wound, so they're quite good. More survivable now would be two wounds each. Um, Ilrathi and Ilrathi's Guardians. I don't normally go through these, but I will mention that the Guardians have gone up to two inches as well. I remember my first game with Moog. These three, uh, these three models, they just died instantly because there was nothing to them. There's only three of them. Well, now they're six wounds to get through. A bit better, maybe. The Vengeful Skull Root. It's a predatory spell. If a unit fails a battle shock test within three inches of the endless spell, add D3 to the number of models that flee. That's nice. And the Strangle Roots. Um, every unit it passed across and every unit within one inch of it at the end of its move on a 2 plus it suffers d3 mortal wounds or d6 mortal wounds if the unit's also within range of an awakened wild wood oh. speaking of awakened wild woods now where can you set them up wholly within your territory and more than 3 inches away from objectives and other terrain features Um, overgrown wilderness you can't see through it blocks line of sight to everything that's not a silver nephew unit and then there's a mechanic for doing mortal wounds to enemy units that are near it during the charge phase what is the mechanic Units that don't have the Silver Nath keyword at the end of the charge phase add two to the roll if there are any wizards around the spells within six inches of an awakened wildwood. That is what within what oh, there's a lot of words here. Basically, on a roll of a six, it does D3 mortal wounds and there's some adding to it if there's magic nearby. Now we're just on to pitch battle profiles now. Uh, a couple of things of note. Uh, tree Lords are battle line in an Oakenbrow army. Kernoff Hunters are battle line in a Heartwood army. Revenant Seekers, battle line in a Harvest Moon army. Spite Revenants, battle line in a Dreadwood army. And Spite Rider Lancers, battle line in a Harvest Boon army. Aladriel is 840 points. Good. Um... Kernoth Hunters are 250 per unit. The Tree Lords, 260 for a regular, 360 for an Ancient, 370 for Spirit of Durthu. 10 Dryads, 100 points. Tree Revenants, 5 for 110 points. Yep. There we go. And that, ladies and gentle folk, brings us to the end of this review uh hope you enjoyed it hope you found it informative i think that is a good book i don't think they've done anything really fundamental to change anything i think they've just tidied a lot of the rules up and brought them in line with the rest of the current edition they've given a few buffs where they were needed and they've doesn't look like they've messed with things where they weren't but it does feel you really get the impression reading through that these things are viciously spiteful in the defence of their world, which is exactly what they're meant to be, so I say hooray. 
Um, yeah. Done. Uh, shout out to my channel members and patrons. Thank you for your ongoing support. You guys are awesome. If you want to support me, check out the description of the uh, attached to this video. There are different ways to do it in there, including channel memberships, um, affiliate links, all sorts of stuff. Uh, until next time, folks, take care, and I will see you in the next one. Bye for now.